sex in the Arab world. I thought that would get your attention. It's about culture, it's about religion, and it's about health. Here in the West, we have all sorts of preconceived notions about the Middle East. That's especially true when it comes to Islam, women, sex, and HIV. For the next hour, we're going to talk with the author of a new book that shatters many of those assumptions. I'm Lawrence Pintak, founding dean of the Edward R. Murrow College of Communication, and this is The Murrow Interview. The Arab Spring and its wintry aftermath is getting all the attention these days. But meanwhile, there's another revolution underway that has implications not just for Arab society, but for the health of a region. Hello, I'm Lawrence Pintak. We're taping today in the auditorium at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle. Our audience includes representatives from the Washington Global Health Alliance, our partner for this show, and HIV researchers here at Fred Hutch. That's because my guest today is not just a journalist who, to use a cliché, lifted the veil on sex in the Arab world. She's also an expert in her own right. Shireen el holds a Ph.D. in immunology from Cambridge, was an award-winning health care correspondent for The Economist, a show host at Al Jazeera, and was the vice chair of the U.N.'s Global Commission on HIV and the Law. Her new book, Sex in the Citadel, Intimate Life in a Changing Arab World. Shireen el thanks so much for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure, Larry. Let me uh, say one proviso for the audience at home on TV or in the radio, um, on the radio, I should say. Uh, we'll be talking about some sensitive issues. We're trying to keep it PG-13. You mean, you mean scenes of a sexual nature? Scenes of a sexual <laughs> nature on the radio and on, uh, not on TV, though. Um, but for those who have kids in the car, et cetera, might be worth switching to another channel and uh, listening online later on. Uh, but let me start with, Shireen, does your father know what you've been doing lately? <laughs> Absolutely. In fact, my father was uh, a great support in writing this book. When it was a gleam in my eye, I did uh, ask him whether he thought uh, this was a wise career move for me. But he, he greatly encouraged me, and in so many ways, he really was my inspiration because my father is Egyptian, uh, he is a devout uh, Muslim, but he's also a questioning, thinking Muslim. And what I found most interesting in, in imbibing my Islam from him was that I found that questioning the faith is not, as conservatives would have it, uh, a way to weakening the faith. It actually has strengthened my father's faith. And my root of questioning was to look at sex and sex within the context of Islam and why today things seem to be so narrow in the Arab world in terms of what is permitted and what is forbidden, whereas in times past there has been much greater scope. And my father really gave me the inspiration for that sort of questioning. The line in which I took was slightly, slightly unusual, uh, but was consistent with my background looking at HIV and, and global health. But, I mean, you went into so many places, as, as you know, I lived in the Arab world for a long, long time. And I should say that Shireen was a fellow based at the center I ran in Cairo as she began working on this book and mm. certainly kept it under wraps. We had no idea what you were up to. Ah, uh, yes. Well, what was interesting is when I started doing the research for this book, and that was five, five years ago, I wasn't certain of the reception I would uh, meet with. And so... Uh, and one, one would think, because of all the taboos around sex, it would actually be quite difficult to get people to talk about these issues. In fact, what I found at the end of the day, it wasn't difficult to get people to talk about sex. It was, getting, it was difficult getting them to stop talking about, <laughs> about sex. And so, yes, my initial reticence um, moved, uh, moved forward, and then I was able to talk more openly. And what was most interesting over the course of five years is that many of the people I interviewed in, in, in the early stages of my research were uh, reluctant to have their names in, in the book. But by the time I had finished, and this was after the uprisings in Egypt and Tunisia and the, 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 the winds of the Arab Spring had blown through the region, uh, when I went back to people and asked, would you mind if I used your name in the book, the vast majority said, yes, please, I want my voice to be heard. 
And it was fairly amazing the way people did open up to you. Absolutely. And what's interesting is that in Egypt in particular, it's not as if people don't talk about sex. They talk about sex all the time. Women speaking to women in private, men speaking to men in private. Where the difficulties come, the reticence, if you like, is when you put men and women together. And then when you try to take this discussion into the public domain, so in the media, in schools, in government, for example. And part of the argument I'm making in the book is that we need to find a way to talk about these taboos, to challenge some of these received wisdoms because they are having really very difficult and quite devastating consequences both for individuals but also for societies as a whole. What was the biggest surprise for you? It was interesting. I hadn't really appreciated the gap between appearance and reality. Of course, this is true not just of sexual life, but of most aspects of life in the Arab region. I'm homogenizing here. I'm talking about the region as if it was a unified whole. And I should say that you are, your mother is Welsh, you're Canadian national, your mother is Welsh, and you, as you said, your father was Egyptian. So you have a foot in each culture. E exactly. But also, in talking about the region, it's 22 states, but not only is there a huge variety between countries, there's also tremendous diversity within countries. But generally speaking, what one sees in Arab societies is, as I said, a disconnect between appearance and reality. And when this comes to sexual life, it's not so much what people are doing that causes ructions, if you like, it's what people are seen to be doing. And if I can just give you one illustration of how this plays out. So the Citadel, which gives my book its title, is the fact that the only socially accepted context for sex in the Arab region is marriage. And it's not any old marriage. It has to be approved by your family, sanctioned by religion, and registered by the state. And anything outside that is forbidden, it's shameful. And the issue now is that we have a large number of people who are outside the Citadel. How are they going to lead their lives? Part of that then has to do with the fact that virginity, and in particular female virginity, is a huge deal in most Arab cultures. And the way that virginity is defined is very interesting. It's not by a state of chastity, the reality. It's by a piece of anatomy, an intact hymen, the appearance. So in one occasion, I was out with a group in Morocco doing uh, outreach work on HIV AIDS, and we were meeting with some uh, female sex workers. And these were uh, students uh, who were turning tricks on the Atlantic Corniche to make enough money to buy mobile phones, get dresses, all this sort of thing. Anyway, these were hairdressing students, and when the outreach workers approached them, and they were these girls were in their sort of late teens, early 20s, and offered them condoms, uh, the young women said, oh, no. We don't need condoms. We only have anal or oral sex because we want to get married and therefore we have to be virgins, defined by an intact hymen. So in the name of an intact hymen, these girls were opening themselves to a world of trouble, including HIV. And so finding a way to bring appearance and reality closer together while maintaining a consistency with the principles of Islam the dominant uh, faith of the region is really one of the big challenges going forward. One of the things you, you keep coming back to through the book, ancient texts about sex in the Arab world, what changed? Well, the, 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 so the history is really, is really fascinating. And, and you, you talked about my father. And one of the reasons I wanted to go, to go and look at sexual culture is that the stories of my father's youth we're so much more open and at ease in the sexual skin than I find my relatives today in Cairo. So I want to know what, what changed. But really, one doesn't need to just look back at our grandfather's or father's time. One can look back a 1,000 years and see this incredibly rich history of writing in, in Arabic. And in fact, if you go back to the time of the Prophet Muhammad, it's fascinating. He used to talk about sex within the context of marriage in an incredibly frank and free and, and informed way. And it wasn't just about pain, it was also about pleasure. And it wasn't just about men, it was also about women. And what's fascinating is that medieval Christian commentators, when they wanted to uh, criticize Islam, would point to the Prophet Muhammad and say, how can this man possibly be a messenger of God? He is so sexed up. And that history of frank discussion about sex continued really until the 19th century. And many of these writings 
were, came from religious scholars who saw nothing incompatible between the needs of the flesh and the needs of the faith. Now, what happened over, really, since the, since the 19th century to today, that closure, it's a very complex historical process, and a number of historians and social scientists have examined this. And it certainly seems to have started with the occupation of many Arab countries by European colonial powers, in particular the, the French and, and the British, who brought a narrower interpretation around sex, um, which seems to have closed down the uh, discourse, certainly in the, in the classes that came in contact with them. What's most interesting, if you fast forward to the 21st, 20th, 21st century, is really the closing down on sex has coincided with the rise of Islamic fundamentalism since the late 1970s. And the closing down on sex is part of a much broader process of a narrowing down of thought in politics, in, in culture, in social issues. And the challenge moving forward is then to look at, well, what is going to happen now as we are stumbling towards a new order in many countries in the Arab region? How are all the aspirations that millions are seeking for in politics, in economics, in cultural life, how will those be reflected in private life, in sexual life? And how will changes in sexual life then affect changes on the bigger stage? And to what degree did all of this, the sexual oppression, these, these pressures, is there a dotted line to the Arab Spring, the other kinds of revolution? Are you saying is there a connection between the political and, and, the, sexual. and the sexual? Well, one doesn't need just to look at Egypt for that. I mean, oh, no. one could argue American politics illustrates that quite nicely. We'll be naming no names in particular. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's interesting. You know, in the Arab region, we have three red lines, these topics. So you're not supposed to challenge in word or deed. One of them is politics, and that line has been well and truly crossed since uh, 2011. The second is religion. And what is interesting is that with the rise and then fall of uh, Islamic uh, conservatives, uh, most notably the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, one is seeing debates about religion in public life that one never really saw before under the Mubarak uh, regime. Uh, and then that third red line is, is sex. I think in some areas one is seeing a certain, um, trend, if, if you like, one is seeing the sort of the questioning that's going on in other domains transferred over to, to sexual life. So in particular, the question of uh, what one call negative sexual rights. And by that, I mean freedom from violence uh, or coercion or discrimination, your ability to lead your sexual life free of these pressures. Well, certainly in the context of sexual violence, when I started this book in 2007, 2008, hardly any woman would speak out about sexual harassment, although we, we knew even then that it was a common phenomenon on the streets of, of Egypt and certainly would not talk about being, being raped. If you now look to where we are in 2013 and certainly after some of the spectacular uh, and tragic cases of uh, organized rape in the streets of, of Cairo earlier this year, one does see some women speaking up and saying, no, not, not all women, not many women, but some women speaking up and saying, I have been raped, speaking publicly, it is my right to be out protesting. And what is most remarkable is that one sees men now standing alongside them saying that it is, it, it, it is this woman's right. To, to be in the public space, and what has happened to her is completely unacceptable. So one sees some of that freedom of expression um, transferring over in terms of some of these negative sexual rights. Where you don't yet see it is what I would call positive sexual rights. So your ability, for example, to express your ideas about sex or to access uh, information about sex. And if I can give you just one example, there was a woman called Alia al-Mahdi, uh, otherwise known as the nude photo revolutionary. Mm -hmm. Uh, in 2011, this is a, a young uh, Egyptian woman who was a student at the American University in Cairo, and she posted nude photos of herself on her blog. Uh, now, I have to say that it's not hard to find pictures of naked Arab women on the internet, but she gave her unveiling a very political twist, and she said, it is my right to express my ideas about sex. It is the freedom that comes from the revolution. Uh, and you know, to be fair, her pictures were more uh, Victorian postcard than Victoria's <laughs> Secret, but they did get millions of hits. And what was most surprising is that, of course, 
religious conservatives came down on her like a ton of bricks and were criticizing her. But while there were a few individuals who supported her, uh, her, ex her freedom of expression and her, her desire to take control of her body, um, most political liberals were actually against her as well. And they said that this is not the revolution we were fighting for. This woman has nothing to do with us. This is not what we want to see in the freedom to come. And so there are limits to how much the change in the political sphere is translating into the personal and sexual sphere. This is the Murrow Interview. I'm Lawrence Pintak. My guest is Shireen al uh, author of Sex and the Citadel. This issue of violence um, in the Arab world, Egypt in particular, there's always been you know, the catcalls, the kind of bizarre hissing catcalls in, in there. Um, most women talk about having had some kind of a sexual, uh, not attack, but hassle on the streets. But in recent years, we've seen these horrible, brutal gang rapes on Tahrir Square and elsewhere. How much is this a political act? It's very hard to tell exactly what is behind these, uh, as you say, these, these tragic uh, cases of uh, organized assault on women. That they were organized, there seems to be little debate. Now, organized by whom is right. the question. But the reality is that even though we may have got rid of the father of the nation in, in Mubarak or more recently in Morsi, um, these are still patriarchies. And uh, women are still subjected to tremendous discrimination. Uh, and the harassment that you're talking about, a recent study from UN Women, showed that 99% of women in, in Egypt, not just in urban areas, but also in some uh, rural areas as well, had experienced some form of sexual harassment. At the end of the day, if you want to cause maximum chaos in Egyptian society, or indeed across uh, the Arab region, then you go after women. Because if you attack a woman's virginity, her chastity, her sexual honor, it's not just a private matter. You're not just attacking her, you're attacking her family. And in particular, you're attacking the menfolk of her family because a woman's honor, sexual honor, is not just an individual matter, it's of concern and it's the, the, the responsibility, if you like, of the men folk. So that's the way to cause maximum chaos in society. Sex is a weapon anywhere in the world. This, this is not unique to the Arab region. It's, one sees it tragically in other contexts as well. But it is particularly powerful because it attacks not just the individual, it attacks the collective. And sex is a very powerful source of shame as well. If at the end of the day, in these attacks that we saw, if you wanted to suggest that the opposition uh, were uh, the protesters were unworthy to have a place in the political process, then you would tar them with the suggestion that they were attacking women. If you wanted to show that the Islamist government of the time uh, was uh, unfit to govern because it could not maintain security in the streets, then you would want to show that they were attacking women. So it's very hard to see who was to say necessarily who was behind these attacks, but many, many players had an incentive to use this as a tool to their own political ends. We will see in the emerging order whether uh, these attacks will hopefully become a thing of the past. Can we I ask you to uh, read a little bit from the book? Uh, there's a passage you're talking about uh, issues of sexual repression in Europe and then giving an analogy to the current state of the Arab world. So this is uh, a passage about uh, Wilhelm Reich, who uh, was a uh, very well-known psychoanalyst of the 1930s who talked about the connection between political repression and sexual uh, repression. And the world that Reich described uh, looks a lot like the sexual terrain of today's <coughs> Arab world. Sex outside of marriage round, roundly condemned. Young people unable to get jobs, afford marriage, or find moments of privacy, reduced to furtive relations without adequate contraception or sufficient information, storing up sexual problems for later life. Women whose sexual needs beyond reproduction were ignored or suppressed, held to double standards of virginity before marriage and chastity ever after, even in the face of miserable, unsatisfactory unions from which there was little escape, given the trouble and stigma of divorce. Abortion outlawed, masturbation condemned, sexual education suppressed. In short, sexual misery of the masses. Pretty depressing. It was then. Then and now. And it is difficult now. And what is 
interesting is that you asked me, for example, what did I find most shocking, most surprising in writing this book? And one of the most amazing things I found is that for all these problems, and they are legion, particularly for women, what I found most interesting and what was unexpected is that there were so many people who were challenging the taboos, not just in the miniature of their own lives, making incredibly bold, brave, and very difficult uh, decisions, but also individuals who were trying to change the situation for communities, even trying to shape national laws, as difficult as that is. So at the end of the day, Sex and the Citadel is not a book about the problems in the Arab world, or not just about the problems. It's also about how people are trying to find solutions and how those solutions often look quite, diff quite different to the way that people have dealt with these issues elsewhere in the world. It, in some places, you talk about the, the, the plethora of legal and semi-legal and religiously sanctioned ways around mm. the issue of having sex outside of marriage. Talk a little bit about that. So there are an amazing array of uh, forms of what one would call unofficial marriage. And although they are not formally registered with the state, they have a certain religious validity depending upon whom one asks. The, the, the most clear-cut version of this is what's called Zawag Mota'a. It's pleasure marriage. It is a structure known as Shia Islam. And it is a very explicit temporary contract that a man and a woman can enter into verbally. And it is essentially for the purpose of having sexual relations. And it is on a timer from, from the start. Uh, Zawag Mota is not permitted in Sunni Islam. Uh, but there are other structures within Sunni Islam to achieve essentially the same end. One of the most controversial forms is called Orfi marriage. And it is uh, causing enormous anxiety in Egypt and many other parts of the, of the Arab region. Because essentially, uh, in Orfi marriage, uh, 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 two young people, for example, in university who can't afford to get married, for example, uh, will try to have some sort of Islamically sound religious, uh, con have a marriage contract that they perhaps sign with a lawyer. Um, it's not registered by the state. Uh, and they do this in order to give themselves some religious, some religious cover, some religious validity. The citadel about marriage, most people want to be inside it. Most people want to get married. The problem is, for example, young people who can't afford to get married. The average age of marriage in many Arab countries is now, uh, for example, uh, late, uh, late 20s for young women and early 30s for young men. Now remember, you're not supposed to be having sex before marriage. This is enshrined in Islam and in Christianity as well. The Prophet Muhammad suggested that uh, we uh, fast until we could marry so, so that we could remain chaste, but he did not mean we're supposed to fast until our 30s. You're going to get very hungry. <laughs> so, so the question the question then becomes, what are you going to do? And, and, and these young people, particularly with the rise of uh, at least overt observance of Islamic forms, are, are struggling to reconcile their needs, their sexual needs, and quite frankly, their right to a sexual life with the strictures of the faith. And so they turn to these informal uh, marriage contracts. But I've got to tell you, the, the people I interviewed in this book, the young women in particular, were deeply torn. They, they, they were not sure if it really was Islamically sound or not. They experienced tremendous guilt. And this is not a lifestyle choice. This is a last resort for these, for these young people. And remember, there's so little sexuality education uh, and access to contraception, although it is possible to buy condoms and uh, oral contraceptives in pharmacies, really young people are reluctant. And so young people are opening themselves to enormous problems. Uh, abortion is highly restricted in most countries in the Arab region. And so the combination of very little uh, sexual education, inadequate access to contraception, and uh, illegal uh, abortion in many cases is, is leading to a world of problem for these young people. How much hypocrisy is built into all of this? It's interesting. To use the term hypocrisy, it suggests also that there is a conscious, uh, a conscious recognition of the gap between appearance and Well, I mean, and, in the context and, and of reality. you can drive down the street in Saudi Arabia and see a sign for vaginal reconstruction. What does that say? I, I, I've right. never seen that sign, uh, uh, actually. I, I, you're, you're, traveling in more you're traveling in more interesting <laughs> neighborhoods than I ever get to. <laughs> 
I must get the address for the next time <laughs> I'm in the neighborhood. Uh, the double standards are, are are extraordinary, and they really are the double standards for men and, and women. And women Again, in a patriarchy, boys will be boys, men have sex before marriage, and people more or less turn a blind eye, and they do not do this for women. And there are so many ways, in particular, to try to maintain female virginity. For example, a, a number of the mothers I spoke to, they don't allow their girls to their daughters to, for example, ride a bicycle um, or uh, to even use the hose for performing ablutions uh, as is required uh, in, in Islam in case they break their hymens. Uh, we have the practice of female genital mutilation in Egypt. About 90% of women age 15 to 49 have been circumcised. Uh, there are other practices, for example, one of them in Egypt is called dokhla, um, this is where you put a sheet under the bride on the wedding night to collect the blood of a defloration. This is not just a practice in the countryside. In the book, I tell the story of an acquaintance, uh, a, um, a woman who is a scientist. She comes from an educated family. Her father is a lawyer. Her father was bombarding her prospective groom with calls saying that, you, you know, you must call me or or call me or text me on the wedding night to ensure that my, my daughter has bled. Um, and the reason for this is because her virginity is a question of the family honor and that the family has delivered an intact bride to, to the groom. Anyway, the prospective groom was getting so many calls from his uh, father-in-law um, that he actually tried to take his wife to the cinema instead of the hotel room because there was so much pressure on him. To, to, to perform. And eventually, the only way they managed to consummate the marriage is he turned off his phone. <laughs> and the next day, her father appeared to collect the, the, the so-called sheet of honor with the blood to show the family and nearest and dearest that, indeed, uh, they had done their duty. So yes, I mean, there, there, there is this enormous set of, of double standards, hypocrisy, if, if you like. The difficulty within Islam, really, is that we don't have a culture of confession unlike Christianity, we are actually enjoined to conceal our sins, to cover our sins for the good of the community, not to spread uh, sin. But the reality is that we have issues we have to talk about now. And the challenge is opening up that space to talk about it. And the reason I keep going back to the history of the Arab region is not because I'm some sort of sexual Salafi. And I think that there is some gold and heyday in the past of, of sexual liberation. No, that's simply not the case. The reason I do this is that for all those people who are pushing the boundaries, whether it's trying to get sexuality education into schools or trying to find a place for unwed mothers, hugely difficult subject. When these people try to push the, the envelope, if you like, and the religious conservatives say, no, you can't do that. This is un-Islamic. This is against our traditions they can use the basis of this book and say, well, no, actually. In ages past, our forefathers spoke very frankly about sex. Why can we not do that today? You parenthetically earlier said boys will be boys. How much is all of this kind of oppression causing boys to be with boys and girls to be with boys who aren't necessarily overtly gay, but out of kind of desperation? It's, it's hard to, to judge what uh, percentage of same-sex relations uh, are occurring because of, for example, uh, gender segregation, which is particularly uh, noticeable in the, in the Gulf states, mm -hmm. for example. Uh, certainly, uh, in my investigations, and I have a chapter on same-sex uh, relations, uh, what, what I found most interesting is that many of the people I, I interviewed, both men and women, although they very clearly knew what gay meant. I mean, they, they, they are connected to the internet, they watch satellite television, they know exactly what gay means in, in the Western context. And some of them very clearly self-defined as gay or, 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 or lesbian, or, or in some cases, queer. But many of the people I interviewed who were having sex with their own sex, but, but I'm not gay. I'm simply not gay. It just doesn't apply to me. So there is a certain fluidity still about um, sexual practices. It's not necessarily an identity. Uh, and what was most interesting is when I talked about this in the history of the gay rights movement in the West and its relevance to the Arab region, uh, 
there are activists now, incredibly bright, uh, informed, you know, plugged into the Twitter sphere and, 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 and blogosphere, et cetera, activists working on these issues. And they gave incredibly uh, trenchant critique of the gay rights movement in the West and why it wasn't relevant to the Arab region. And one of them put it to me very uh, succinctly. She said to me, Shireen, what are you talking about a sexual identity? I don't even have an individual identity. Now, this is a woman living in Lebanon. She said, in the records of the state, I am down as the daughter of my father. And if I were to marry, I would be the wife of my husband. How can you even talk about me having a sexual identity when I don't even have an individual identity? And so the question of finding space for people who cross the heterosexual line is a very interesting one in the Arab region. But again, it underscores the point I make in the book that men, very often the solutions that people, people are finding are very different to the history of sexual change in the West. How much is sexual oppression tied to political oppression? I mean, how much of it is, it is it a tool? Certainly if one looks back at uh, the Mubarak regime, and in fact, if one looks to the early days after the downfall of Mubarak, uh, talking specifically about Egypt, one sees sex regularly used as, as a tool of political control. Certainly it's, it's, it's an instrument of torture. Uh, we had the case, for example, of the so-called blue bra girl, who was a protester who was dragged through the, dragged through the streets of, uh, of Cairo, sort of almost exposed uh, sexually. We had the terrible case of the virgin forced virginity testing of female protesters uh, by done the by military. the military. Sorry? By the military. By the military government that followed Mubarak. Torture of male prisoners uh, sodomy is uh, is an age old age old instrument of oppression. And in, 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 in Arabic, the term is to break one's eye, basically. So to cause so much shame that one one essentially uh, suppresses uh, the the victim. Sex is used as a tool of uh, controlling uh, freedom of expression. Very often, we saw in Egypt attempts to censor the internet on the grounds, you know, pornography is rife. Uh, but within that sort of sweep, very often conveniently can take in, can take up political dissent uh, uh, as well. And it is, of course, a, a tool of control. When you create all these taboos, you inhibit people, and it's not it's not just dictators who use this, political dictators, but religious conservatives in, across the world, not just in Egypt, but for conservatives, sex wrapped up in religion is an incredibly powerful tool of subjugation of, of people because you hit at the heart of the individual. And then the question moving forward now, as I said, as we try, as we stumble, struggle on our scenic route to democracy with our emergency stops and our detours uh, and our bumps in the road, how are we going to open up on these sexual issues and really challenge these taboos? Because they don't just inhibit us in private life, they also connect to our inhibition in public life as well. This is the Murrow Interview. I'm Lawrence Pintak. My guest is Shireen al author of Sex and the Citadel. So you talked a lot about ignorance, lack of education. How does that play out in terms of health? HIV is a rising problem in the Arab region. What's interesting is if one looks at most recent numbers that have come from UNAIDS, in terms of the global HIV epidemic, we are seeing really tremendous progress. For example, the number of new infections has fallen by about a third since 2001. Deaths are declining. Uh, the number of people on treatment is rising. There are a lot of positive aspects to the story of the global HIV AIDS epidemic, except in the Arab region. There are only two parts of the world now in which HIV is still on the rise, increasing numbers of new infections and uh, rising death toll from AIDS, and one of them is the Middle East and, and North Africa. And the vulnerability comes from, in large part, the taboos around sex, the inability to talk about these things openly, uh, the stigma around condoms, for example. So I can tell you that uh, the problem with condoms, they're, they're so rarely used in, uh, in, in, in many parts of the Arab region. And, and the reason for that is that uh, birth control is within marriage is, is the responsibility of a woman. 
And so if you're using condoms, you must be having sex outside of marriage, and that is forbidden. And so there is this huge stigma to, to, to buying condoms, aside from the universal male complaint about them uh, as being undesirable and uncomfortable and the rest of it. Uh, and for example, in the outreach I was talking about to the female sex workers that was being done by this wonderful group in, uh, in Morocco, Morocco being a real leader in the uh, rising to the challenge of HIV AIDS, if you're a sex worker and you're caught with condoms in your purse, it can be used as grounds for arrest because it appears to be proof positive that you are a female sex worker. Again, not unique to the Arab world, but certainly a problem within the region. It's a huge challenge. Although we appear to have very little HIV, if you look at the general population, we now have really co what are called concentrated epidemics that in certain groups, for example, men who have sex with men or injecting drug users or female sex workers or prisoners, uh, that one sees really quite alarming rates of HIV, 5, 10, 15%. And no man is an island when it comes to HIV. When a female sex worker is infected. She may be having sex with an injecting uh, drug user. Uh, female sex workers are usually married, and so they can pass this on to their husbands and, and vice versa. Uh, men who have sex with men don't just have sex with men. They also have sex with women. So one can't assume that it's going to stay in these concentrated, uh, uh, concentrated groups. And what is the great opportunity in the Arab region, really an opportunity that millions are quite literally dying for in the rest of the world, is that the epidemic is in a situation now where it could be stopped in its tracks if there was the will to, to confront it. And part of that is facing up to the reality that people are having sex outside of marriage, that there is female sex work, that we do have men having, we have men having sex with men, but that requires quite a lot of courage. And there are some really marvelous examples of, of people, particularly in civil society, who are stepping up to the plate and addressing these issues. There are also plenty of examples of just turning a blind eye. And are governments, are any governments stepping up, or do they all have their head in the sand? Uh, certainly there are some <clears throat> notable um, exceptions to this sort of uh, blind eye, if you like. One of them is, is, is Morocco, which really has uh, one of the most uh, extensive, not perfect by any means, but one of the most extensive systems of actually trying to measure HIV surveillance system. Uh, they have effective civil society. Uh, they are managing to get many more people on treatment than, than most other parts of the Arab region. Uh, it's still highly stigmatizing. To say that you have HIV is not something that you're going to speak openly about in the Arab region, and particularly if you're a woman. I have done some work with a new NGO across the Arab region which is trying to help women living with HIV. And the vast majority of women in the Arab region who have HIV are infected through their husbands. And these are truly tragic stories because the typical case of a woman discovering that she's HIV positive is to give birth to her first child. And you must remember there is so much pressure to reproduce in the Arab region, that in Egypt, for example, you are expected to produce a child within nine months of, of, of marriage. And if you don't, it is a great tragedy. And I know young women in particular who are going on fertility treatment even before they get married for fear that they will not be able to produce a, a child on demand. Anyway, the classic story is of a woman, her, she has her first child, her child is unwell, they go to the hospital, they discover that the child is HIV positive, she is HIV positive, husband contracted HIV through injecting drug use or having sex with another man or frequenting a female sex worker, but the burden of stigma falls on a woman. So that, for example, husbands will be able to tell the family perhaps that they have HIV, but the woman cannot because it is assumed, even though she contracted it from her husband, that she is a bad woman that she has done something wrong, she has had relations outside of marriage. So all the, the, the burden of regulation and, you know, frankly, discrimination on women comes in, in just in this hugely concentrated, uh, concentrated situation when they have HIV. And empowering them is a huge challenge because it's the challenge facing all women, whether they have HIV or not. How much of all of this is migrating from the Gulf? How much influence has the conservative approaches of the Gulf influenced North Africa? 
to a certain extent, North Africa, but much more prominently Egypt. And, and so many of the people I interviewed in, in the book talk time and time again how, of how Wahhabi Islam, uh, the, uh, the strain of Islam prominent in Saudi Arabia, had really, as they put it, warped Egyptian interpretations of Islam. Uh, and that in particular, everything seemed to be about sex, that religion being Islamically observant was not about dealing with corruption or, or poverty or torture or, or all the other injustices. It was about regulating a woman's body and controlling and controlling sex. Uh, and I think there is an element of, 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 of truth to that, that there has been this closing down in Egypt. It's not just the impact of influence from the Gulf, although it's very, you know, it's pronounced in Egypt because Egypt sends millions of migrant workers to the Gulf where they, they, they are influenced by this, they're exposed to the strain of Islam. And also Saudi Arabia in particular has become a media powerhouse and so is exporting its, its brand of Islam. I think it's interesting to look now in Egypt with the rise and fall of the Muslim Brotherhood. And will we see this uh, effect of very conservative Islam on interpretations within Egypt and North Africa as well? Will we see that waning too? Certainly the Salafis, the ultra-conservative Muslims with their, with, their, with their face beards and with their Careful long now. beards. <laughs> yes, yes. Much more, uh, much more luxuriant than yours, uh, uh, Larry, and their niqab, uh, the face veil, certainly leapt out of the gate with the fall of Mubarak. And they were quickly... Uh, quite frankly, put in, put in their place by Egyptians who, who the vast majority do not support their very austere uh, uh, vision of Islam. So it will be interesting to see now moving forward what with the political travails of Islamic conservatives, how will that translate into Islamic fundamentalism as it has shaped uh, daily life, particularly for women. So the question to ask in the years to come, uh, will we see more women take off hijab. About 90% of young women in Egypt now cover their hair. Will we see that change in the Which years Which is a come? generational change. Absolutely, but the question to ask, how much of that is really a response to dictatorship? Remember, during the years of, of, of Mubarak, what were your chances for civic participation? Very, very slim, unless you were a member of the Muslim Brotherhood or you were engaged with, with one of the Salafi groups. Also, quite frankly, the Mubarak regime completely ignored the needs of most people in terms of housing and sanitation and health care, the basic aspects of life, elements which these conservative groups provided. So it's, it's not just from an interest of ideology that people gravitated to these groups. It was sheer practicality getting on with life. Now, again, moving forward, we, one would hope, and, and millions are hoping that, that the, the emerging governments will be able to pay better attention to the needs of the people. We will see. But again, it will be interesting to look at how that affects the impact of religiosity uh, on everyday life in the years to come. This is the, interv the Murrow interview. I'm Lawrence Pintak. I don't know why I can't say the Murrow interview today. Uh, my guest is Shireen al the author of Sex and the Citadel. We talked about HIV and other STDs, but there's a whole other dimension to sexual disease in the Gulf, and that is related to intermarriage. Can you talk about that? Oh, it's interesting that you phrase it in, in, in that way. A consanguineous marriage, so marriage between uh, relatives, is, is common in, in many parts of the Arab region. In Egypt, for example, uh, about 30% of young people marry their, their cousins. It's usually first cousins. Uh, and uh, yes, there are health problems related uh, to that. Certain uh, uh, hereditary disorders are more common uh, when there is intermarriage. It's very interesting, uh, in my book, um, I myself was engaged when uh, I started writing uh, this, this book, and I went to a wedding fair, a uh, bridal show uh, in Abu Dhabi, which really was uh, this extraordinary uh, exhibition of conspicuous consumption. Uh, um, more uh, bling than uh, one would see probably at the, I don't know, MTV Rap Awards or, 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 or whatever. Um, it was really amazing. And I, I met some young women there, and they were getting married to, to their cousins. And one young woman in particular, she's highly educated university graduate. Uh, we were talking about fashion and movies and trends in both the Arab region but also in the West. So she was very much plugged into the wider world. And she was marrying 
her cousin and I asked her, would you not want to have what we call love story in Egypt, which is an unarranged marriage? And, and the vast majority of marriages now in Egypt are people that you meet through relatives or, or, or friends. And she said to me, no, I don't think love story is really what I want because you don't really know what you're getting. I think it is better if my father chooses. Um, and that was interesting. I mean, she, she, she was making a very different decision to educated, worldly young people in the West, young women in the West. Um, but what I found most interesting is that time and time again, when I talked to young women about sexual options and personal freedoms in the West, they had a very articulate and nuanced argument about what they liked and what they didn't, what they didn't like. And again, analogous to that, um, I met uh, a, a young woman uh, in Egypt, and she runs a, a club for divorced women. It's a Facebook site and a radio station, and divorce is still highly stigmatizing in many Arab communities because it takes you outside a, the citadel, a place you don't want to want to be. And I asked her, uh, because she had got married after a whirlwind romance uh, and then really suffered after that, and I asked her, do you not think it would have been better if you'd had the chance to really get to know your husband uh, sexually, um, as in the West? And, and she paused and she said, no, I, I don't think that that sort of freedom makes marriages any better. Just look at Madonna and her many husbands. <laughs> she does have a point. <laughs> but, but what was most interesting is she then went on and said, no, I do not think that that is what is best about relations in the West. What I think is best and what I would love to see here is the way that men treat women. And her vision of the West is that there was just more equality in relations between men and women and that husbands respected their wives, gave them more freedom, treated them as, as equals. And she said to me, interestingly, that is what I am doing with my son. That is how I am raising him to see women, that the divorced woman is not a bad woman. And that element of divorce goes back to the young woman I met at the Abu Dhabi Fair who was marrying her cousin. Because again, if you marry without your family's consent, the family is hugely important in your life. And your decisions are not just your own decisions. They affect the family. Um, if you fall out of marriage, then all you have at the end of the day is you have to go back to your family. It's really hard as a single woman to live on your own in the Arab region. It's not accepted in most circles. So it's very hard to go against your family. But time and time again, women and men really had these highly articulate, reasoned arguments about what they liked about the West and what they could do without. And one of the arguments in my book is that it's very important for those outside the Arab region to listen very carefully. Because when people in the Arab region do things differently, do not assume that it is out of ignorance. It is often out of information and insight about their own culture. That doesn't necessarily just apply to sex. I mean, one Absolutely. could apply that to a lot Absolutely. of politics. Uh, we're going to come to the audience in a moment. If anyone would like to ask a question, if you want to head up to the microphone. Uh, you mentioned the Bling Fest in Abu Dhabi um, for the wedding, the wedding show. That expectation has a big part in this frustration of people not getting married as well, doesn't it? Absolutely. Economics underpins so much of sexual life uh, in the Arab region as it does anywhere else in the world, and it really is an underexplored uh, area. One of the most interesting uh, placards that uh, was seen during the 2011 uh, uprising against Mubarak was uh, a young man who was holding up a sign saying, go to President Mubarak, I want to get married. <laughs> and, and the reason for that is that marriage has become very expensive. It is this exercise in conspicuous consumption, as I've said, because the economies in the region have opened themselves up to the full flood of, of global capitalism. Uh, and men are expected to bear most of the costs from the wedding onwards through marriage, but unemployment, particularly amongst young people, is running at about 30% in Egypt and many countries. Mm -hmm. in, Even Saudi in, Arabia, it's very high. It, exactly. And so if you can't afford to get married, then you basically enter into a state of suspended adolescence. It's hard to move out of your parents' place, all the more so if you're a woman, and you're not supposed to be having sex, and, and, and you're not, definitely not supposed to be having children. So marriage is your ticket to adulthood. And yes, it is causing enormous, uh, enormous frustrations. Uh, and the argument that most governments will make is, oh, it's just an economic problem. So if we just give you money to get married, uh, then that will solve all the issues. But there is another factor behind this. Uh, time and time again, I met 
women educated, because remember, female education rates are now very high in most of the Arab region, and in parts of the Gulf, there are more women than men in university. So I would meet these women in their 30s. They were bright, educated, dynamic. They had jobs, which is unusual for women in the Arab region, and they were unmarried. And this was not, again, by choice. They wanted to get inside the citadel, but essentially they defy gender expectations. And one woman in Tunisia, a young doctor, put it to me with sort of devastating simplicity. She said to me, you know, the women, we are getting more and more educated, but the man, he's still at the prehistoric stage. <laughs> <laughs> and that comes back to the issue also of the woman, the di woman with a divorced, uh, divor divorced club, in that how do you raise your sons to see, to see women? If you raise your sons to think that they are better, than their, their sisters, than, than your daughters, for example. If the, your daughters are supposed to serve your sons, if your sons can go out and your daughter has to stay behind to protect the hymen, if your sons can go far and wide on the internet but you are always watching your girls as to what they are looking at, these are how the inequalities start and they get translated into marriages in a generation. So the education that we, educational reform that we desperately need to see in the Arab region is not just in the classroom, it's also in the living room. Do we have a question in the audience? Hi, my name is Christine Zamorodi, and I studied Middle East Studies at the University of Texas. And um, back to your discussion of the Arab Spring, one of the things I was thinking as that was unfolding was it was very much about economics on a lot of levels, um, the lack of income and things that you've been speaking to. And fairly quickly, my view was that there was an intersection between that and the sexual situ tensions of the lack of ability to marry, and almost to the point that maybe that could be a direct cause, and not just Egypt, but region-wide, and I just wondered what your thoughts were on that. There has been a lot of speculation, in particular, about the outbreaks of sexual harassment uh, in, in, in Egypt and in other parts of the Arab region. Are they related to sexual frustration that... And the argument that you'll often hear from people on the streets is that the women are out there and they're bold and the men are sexed up because of the movies and the music videos and yet they, they can't afford to get married and it just bubbles out. I, I think it's much more complex than that. We're not just talking about sexual frustration. We're talking about frustration full stop. The patriarchy is oppressive to, to women, but it's also oppressive to men. If you're not at the top of that, pyramid, if you like, things are very tough. And if you're a young man who can't get a job, you have very few prospects, it's not surprising that when you put men under pressure, they behave badly. And the people next down the line to behave badly to are women. So this, it, it's part of the general frustration and the general uh, oppression. And one of the arguments I make in the book, it is now important to start looking at men in the Arab region. We don't know a lot about sexual life in any quantitative fashion. There's no Kinsey-like report yet in, in the Arab world. But what we do know about sexual life, and that's mainly about problems, not pleasures, is mainly to do with women. We know so little about men and what men want. And it's interesting gap, really, because men we see as the pillars of the patriarchy. Uh, and yet, uh, because, um, because they're seen as the oppressors and the violators and the ones who spread disease and dysfunction and exploitation, really they haven't been part of, they haven't been seen as part of the solution, they've only been seen as part of the problem. But now really is the time to start asking hard questions about how do men feel about their world and the changing role of, of, of women. And uh, this is research that really has, is only, is only starting in the Arab region, but, but very important. Sounds like the next book. Ah, uh, well, watch this space. <laughs> Speaking of the book, um, it's selling in the Arab world? It is on sale in uh, a number of countries, among them uh, Egypt and Lebanon. There must be some folks out there who can't be very happy. I haven't heard from them yet. Uh, uh, there is, uh, the, the, the reception to the book has been extremely positive in the Arab region and I'm receiving interestingly messages on Facebook and, and, and Twitter uh, from people saying really the, the book has made a big difference uh, and, and, uh, and I'm now able to speak to my parents for example about these issues I've brought the book into to home. I, I heard from one uh, counselor at a university in Morocco 
who said to me, we are having all these young women come to us and they're having unplanned pregnancies and they have sexually transmitted infections. We went to the university authorities and asked, can we do a study on sexual behavior amongst the undergraduates? And they said, no, no, of course you can't. Sex outside of marriage is illegal in Morocco. So if we were to ask these questions, we would be seen to be condoning this. But then these very persistent counselors went to the authorities and the university with my book and my website, sexinthecitadel.com, and the authorities were unaware that so much had been written about sex in the Arab region. And they said, look, if other people are doing this research, we should be able to do that too. Wow. Awesome. Uh, so I, 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 there is as yet no fatwa against the book, although fatwas, <laughs> I am told, are very good for sales. Uh, <laughs> but, but actually, my book is, 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 is deeply respectful of, of Islam because I am a, a, a practicing Muslim. I am a believing Muslim. And well, I do also think, having been brought up in Canada, that, that one should have freedom of, of, of faith and that whether one chooses to live one lo one's life within the parameters of Islam or outside the parameters should be one's own business and one's, you know, the question of one's relationship to God. That freedom doesn't really exist in the Arab world as yet. So as far as the law goes and the constitutions go, but it is within the framework of Islam. So my book is arguing that within the framework of Islam, there are many more possibilities for leading more fulfilled sexual lives, that it is not black and white as uh, conservatives would, would have it, that on matters of sex as to do with so much in life, uh, Islam is offering at least 50 shades of gray. <laughs> and on that note, thank you so much for oh, being my with pleasure, us. Larry. Thank you. And And thanks to the staff here at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. Thanks to all of you in the studio and at home. For the Murrow Interview, I'm Lawrence Pintak.